enjoyed the worship as well. Amen. One of the things that I love seeing uh, when it comes down to, to worship in so many different ways is I look at the different videos on YouTube and I see many of the individuals are so young in age. Um, most of those people definitely much younger than me. Amen. But to see young people on fire for God is an, uh, is an amazing thing. Uh, last night as I was just having a time of worship, I was, I was looking at these different, because they got these different groups where they have sessions now, and they just all together, and they're worshiping, and it's just, uh, it's something. It's something to see. I'm going to tell you something that really touched my heart last night, and whenever you get a chance, uh, go to YouTube and just put in Justin Bieber's name. A lot of us know Justin Bieber. He's been around for a long time, very popular, a young guy. And we know when he was doing his thing, he was doing his thing. And we know at one point in time, he was off the chain. Uh, but his life has changed so much. And when you just watch him worship, you see the anointing of God. You don't see a performance. You see a genuine anointing of God and I think about him somebody who was strong in the world doing his thing in the world but 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 God got a hold of him and he's not ashamed to testify about Jesus and so when he worships it's just so wonderful and it's just so pure amen and so I encourage you when you get an opportunity just just go and 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 check out some of the, the worship sets that he actually has. Amen. So come on, let us get our hands, our Bibles in our hands so we can go forward with our Bible declaration on this morning. Amen. Let us declare, this is my Bible. This is my sword, my instructions for life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I shall hear it, receive it, apply it, and obey. Share it with others who don't know the way. My heart is open, so have your way. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. In Jesus' name, I'll never be the same. Speak to me, Lord. Speak today. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would be with us as we get into the word of God on today, Lord God. I pray that everyone in this room, those that are tuning in, will be able to be blessed by this word on this morning. Father, I ask right now that you just allow me to decrease and your Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me will increase, Lord God. And I pray that this word is planted on good ground, Lord God, that it will bring forth good fruit in the lives of those that, that hear it and apply it. So, Father, I just ask that you simply have your way on today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. As you're taking your seats, I want you to turn your Bibles to uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And while you're finding James chapter 1, uh, welcome all of you all that are tuning in via Facebook Live. And those of you all that will watch the replay, I am Apostle Tanya Mitchell, the founding pastor here at Nothing But The Truth Ministries located in Clinton, Maryland. And I pray that you will... Uh, find your way to the building one day to come and worship with us. Amen. We love to have you online, but it's nothing like that in-person worship. And so we're going to look at James chapter 1, starting at verse 12. And uh, we're going to read on down. And uh, I, this message, different things birthed this message. And this message was uh, basically birthed when uh, Elder Gen uh, Minister Janetta actually taught her Bible study. And she taught a Bible study on the character of Jonah. And as we got to the end of the Bible study, God just started showing me some different things about Jonah. And we got on the subject about Jonah didn't really have a true repentant heart. He cried out to God in the midst of his troubles because he didn't like the troubles and the afflictions that he was in. So he cried out because... And the Bible said because of his afflictions. But even though he cried out, his thinking didn't change, which means his attitude didn't change. Uh, 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 even though he went through the motions and did what God eventually told him to do, he still wasn't right on the inside. 
And I said, when it comes down to it, I, I, I didn't see genuine repentance. And I think there's some things that's missing uh, in the body of Christ when it comes down to, to repentance. And so uh, 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 the title of today's message is Breaking the Power of Sin. Breaking the Power of Sin. And as I said, it was, it was birthed on that, 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 that Wednesday when we was in Bible study. And so let us read James chapter 1. Starting at verse 12, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the word of the Lord says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who what? Love him. Let no one say when he is tempted. I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what? His own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived... It gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Conception, when it takes place, is going to bring forth something. And the truth is, some of us need to have some spiritual abortions. Some of us need to have some spiritual abortions and cancel what has been conceived because of our own choices amen i like that same passage of scripture in the amplified version amen the amplified james chapter 1 starting at verse 12 and the amplified said amplified says blessed meaning happy spiritually prosper prosperous you can be prosperous in the natural, have all the things that you desire and want, have your bank account full, your pockets fat and some, but it doesn't mean that you're spiritually prosperous just because you're prosperous in the natural. And so blessed, it means happy, spiritually prospered, favored by God, and it's nothing like having the favor of God. And so blessed is the man who is what? Steadfast under trial. Because we will go through and experience trials while here on this earth. But blessed is the man who is steadfast, that, that, that's rooted, that's grounded, that's steadfast under trials and uh, per perseveres when tempted. For when he has passed the test, because one thing about it, life is going to bring you a series of tests. Will you pass or will you fail? Will you pass or will you fail? And it says, for when he has passed the test and been approved, then there is something that he will receive from the Lord. It says he will receive the victor's crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. No, you're not. Don't let anyone say when I am being tempted by God for temptation does not originate from God, but from our own flaws. For God cannot be tempted by what is evil and he himself tempts no one. But each one is tempted. When he himself, but each one is tempted when he is dragged away, enticed, and baited to commit sin by his own worldly desires, lust, passion. Then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. See, 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 sin is the byproduct of other things that's already going on on the inside of us. See, the, the actual sin that, that comes forth is a manifestation of what has been going on inside of us. And a lot of times it starts with what? A thought. Oh, we just don't, uh, it, we don't just do stuff. We think about it. 
And so then when the illicit desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin has run its course, it gives birth to death. Do not be misled, my beloved brothers and sisters. And so when we sin, how many of y'all know we often have so many excuses and we try to justify our actions. I want to I wanna share with you the footnote in my Bible and the points that it bring out. Amen. And so uh, it says it's easy to blame others uh -huh, and make excuses for evil thoughts and wrong actions. And, and, and we use such excuses as these. Uh, one of the excuses that we use is it's the other person's fault. Oh, when we sin, we want to say it is the other person's fault. We want to blame it on somebody else. Amen. And we can see that taking place going as far back into the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve when they actually sinned against what God had commanded. Amen. It was Eve when, when questioned about her actions. Eve said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That's what she said. And, and, and Adam's response was, uh, the woman you gave me to be with, she gave me of the tree and I ate. It's a trip because even when you hear Adam, Eve, she wanted to blame the serpent. She wanted to blame the devil. But if you listen to what Adam is saying, Adam is blaming two people. Let's just be for real. He blaming God and he blaming the woman. Because guess what? You the one that gave it to me. And so he said, you gave to me the woman to be with me and she gave me of the tree and I ate another excuse that we actually try to use when it comes down to us giving into sin or, and trying to use these excuses and justify we, we, we have a tendency to say I couldn't help it yes you could yes you could we can all help it we 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 we, we, we can we we have a choice in this thing called life as far as what we do or what we don't do uh, we, we say things like, it's the other person's fault. We say, I couldn't help it. We also say something that we've heard before, where everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. Just because everybody is doing something, does that mean that you have to do it, especially when you know it doesn't line up with the will of God? I think about the Bible when it talks about the wide road and the narrow road. And it talks about there are very few that find the narrow road that leads to God. But the wide road, oh, it's a whole bunch of people on that path. Because it's, it's, it's easy to do wrong. Hello? Can I get a witness in here? Is it easy to do wrong? It's, it's hard to do right. But it's easy to do wrong. And so the truth is, I used to tell my daughters, I said, if everybody going to hell, you trying to go too because everybody else going? At the end of the day, but these are excuses that we use. I mean, I don't want to seem like the, the, the square. I mean, you know, everybody's doing this. Everybody's doing that. I don't want to seem like a holy roller and all that. Come on now. It ain't about people. It's about your individual relationship with God. But these are the excuses that we actually use. Everyone is doing it. Oh, oh, here's another one, and, I, and, and these are the, the, the things from a footnote, the points, but of course I'm elaborating, but another one is, was, it was just a mistake. How many of y'all know sometimes when we sin, when we cut up, we say it was just a mistake? Well, let me tell you what a mistake is. A mistake is a wrong action or statement proceeding from faulty judgment or inadequate knowledge. So let me tell you something. If you know what to do and you don't do it, boo, it's not a mistake. Because you have adequate knowledge of what God wants you to do. So it's not a mistake. See, for a babe in Christ, because we got different spiritual levels in the kingdom of God. Amen. And so when you have an individual that is a, a babe in Christ, there are some things that they may do that's against the word of God and the will of God. Uh, uh, and, and it's really a mistake because they don't know no better. They haven't really grown in the things of God. They don't really know what God's word says about this or that. Let's take, for instance, somebody give their life to Christ today, right? At that moment, they are a babe. They are new in Christ. They will probably go about their daily life and continue to do some of the same old stuff that they already always did. 
because they don't know no better. But then as they begin to grow and as they begin to read the word, they be like, oh, God don't like this. Oh, my mouth. I used to say these things, but the Bible is saying I shouldn't say these things. Oh, Lord, my attitude. I need to check that. And so, so a lot of times a babe in Christ will make a lot of mistakes. But some of us ain't babes. But we still make some wrong choices. But it's not because we don't know. It's not because it's a mistake. Because for many believers, that's not the case. We know what God's word says. We know what he wants us to do. But guess what? We do just the opposite. So we can't say it's a mistake. We know. And so I think about the word of God in, in Romans. You don't have to turn there. But Romans 13, 13 through 14, you know, it tells us, it said, let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions to fulfill the lust of the flesh. The reality of it is we have to make provisions to do certain things that we know don't please God. Even when it comes down to me cussing you out, hello, in order for me to cuss you out, I got to think about it first and choose wisely the words that I want to use when I open up my mouth. And so at that moment, I make provisions to just let it rip. Even though the Holy Spirit may be telling me to shut up, don't say anything. But at the end of the day, I have to make provisions, especially, guess what? If I'm thinking about something that you said or something that you did to me, and I pick up my phone and dial your number because of what's going on inside of my head, baby, I am making provisions to fulfill the lust of my flesh because my flesh want to get off and cuss you out. I want to give you a piece of my mind. Oh, come on, you can get hot, horny, and bothered and want to go have sex and lay up with somebody. Guess what? The thoughts start in your mind first. But before you actually get to that place, you have to put some things in motion in order for what you're thinking about to even come to pass. And so at the end of the day, the Bible tells us not to make provisions to fulfill the lust of our flesh. But a lot of times we're not babes. We have years under our belt and we just make decisions to disobey God so baby you can't say it's a mistake again a wrong action the mistake is a wrong action or statement proceeding from faulty judgment or inadequate knowledge oh another mistake another excuse that we try to use or justify is we like to say nobody's perfect Oh, come on now. Y'all know when, we, when it comes down to our stuff and the things that we do, the first thing we want to say is nobody's perfect. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians real quick. Ephesians chapter 4. Nobody's perfect. Well, I have a question. Can we ever be perfect? Meaning sinless? No. Not at all. Jesus Christ was the only one that was absolutely sinless. But guess what? We can be perfect according to the word of God. Let us look at Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 11. We, 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 we've seen this scripture, many of us. And so it says, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God. What? To a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That same passage in the New Living Translation, you don't have to turn there, but it says their responsibility, talking about the fivefold ministry gifts, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith 
and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature. That word is perfect. See, see, the New King James Version says uh, perfect, but this translation says mature. So when the Bible talks about how we can be perfect, it's talking about us being mature in the Lord. Measuring up, it says, to the full and complete standard of Christ. So guess what? We got to stop using the excuse that nobody's perfect when we can be perfect. We can be perfect according to the scripture that talks about us being mature. We shouldn't be immature believers for the rest of our life. And when we get to a point of maturity, it says that we will measure up to the full and complete standards of Christ. Not standards of yourself, not standards of your mother and father, not the standards of the world, but of the standards of Christ. Because if you want to know how you should live as a child of God, don't ask your neighbor. Don't ask your mother. Don't ask your father. Ask the Bible to speak to you about how you should live your life. Because the Bible is basic instructions before leaving the, this earth. And it gives us the standards that we as the children of God should live by. God's standards, God's morals, not the world's. And so, oh, another good one that we, we like to say when we, when we cut up, when we sin against God and disobey and walk in, in rebellion. We, we, we like to say the devil made me do it just like Adam and Eve. Eve said, Satan. The devil made her, right? He the one that gave it to her and then she ate. Well, we like to say that the devil made me do it. And can I tell y'all this? I know Satan is probably sick and tired of us blaming stuff on him. <laughs> stuff on him that he ain't even do. You see, he, he did his part, but you did it. <laughs> see, that's the key. We got to understand. He did his part, but you did it. I did it. We're the ones that, 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 that take what he presents to us and roll with it. And so an excuse that we try to use to justify is the devil made me do it. And so what you got to understand is that Satan and his demons, yes, they are real. And yes, they can influence you and I without a shadow of a doubt. They will present us with temptation. Come here, Glenn. Come on up here real quick. I'm the devil. I'm the devil. And this is sin. And I, I want to tempt you with this. Amen. Take that. Yeah. Okay. Y'all see that? I just use them as an example. Now, who am I? <laughs> who am I? <laughs> I'm the devil, right? And I told you, what was that that I got? I said, it's sin, right? And I said, take it. I ain't forced you, though, did I? I ain't forced you. You just took that thing all quick. Go on, sit down. <laughs> Look, some of them started laughing when you came up here, Glenn, because they already know that. Amen. I couldn't, I couldn't use somebody that's familiar with that. But guess what? That's how easy it is for us to fall for the enemy. Because he will tempt us with something, and we just easily just, okay. We just take it. And so the bottom line is Satan and his demons may influence us. They may present us with temptation, the bait, amen. But he and his demons cannot make us do anything. He can't make us do anything. Now, demons can have a strong influence on your life because of doors that you have opened in your life. You can have demons. Even as a child of God, you can have demons and be strongly influenced by their tactics. Oh, somebody may say, I don't understand that. How can a Christian have a demon? Let me tell you something, baby. If before salvation you had a legion, just because you say yes to Jesus, that don't mean the legion say we out. No, no, no. There's deliverance that has to take place, spiritual growth that has to take place for them to realize we can't stay here no more. And so when they realize that they got to go, but as long as they are living and operating in your life, guess what? They are going to try to influence you to do so many things that is not of God. And because they have such a strong influence in our lives, again, because of doors that we have opened, amen, it seems as if we're on automatic pilot for the devil. It seems like we just doing what the devil is making us to do. But what you got to understand is that when it comes down to really understanding automatic palate, you still have control. It seems like you're on automatic palate, 
Because the influence of the enemy is so strong in your life and has been for so long. But even when you think about autopilot, you know that for real, you still have control. When you think about it, airplanes have what you call an autopilot. And so an autopilot is a system that is used to control the trajectory of an aircraft, your life. Amen. Without constant hands on control by a human operator being required. See, it's able to function and flow. But guess what? The human operator had to push the button. See, that's us opening up the door. The human operator had to push the button. And so when you push the button and you open up the door to the enemy, a lot of times it seems like your hands is off and you just going through the motions and allowing the enemy to have his way. But, 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 but guess what? You gave him permission. Permission. And so what we have to understand is that an autopilot system is used to control the trajectory of an aircraft without constant hands-on control by a human operator being required. Autopilots, demons, do not replace human operators, you and I, but assist them in controlling the aircraft of your life. See, 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 that's what the demons do. They assist us with controlling the direction of our life and what it is that we do or don't do. And so that's what makes it seem like sometimes we're on automatic pallet because we've given the enemy so much access and he's run our lives for so long. See, because once you hit all old pallet, it's almost like, have your way. We don't understand. When we open up the door to the enemy, we say, have your way. Wreak havoc in my life. Do whatever you want to do. And when you understand the power of open doors, you're, let me tell you something. You want to keep them shut. And so, when you think about it, in the spirit, people of God, we must learn to hit the disengage button. And turn off the enemy's autopilot tactics in our lives. When we, when we realize what's going on, we got to understand, okay, for real, I engaged it, hit the autopilot, but now I got to be the same one to disengage it. And so, scientists, I, I was looking at some stuff, and this is what scientists had to say about people operating on autopilot. Because sometimes we do just go through life like we have no control and things just happen and we just doing this. And so here's what scientists have to say about people operating on autopilot. He said, it says, ever realized you have driven yourself home but haven't really been paying attention? Brain scans have revealed that when your mind wanders... It switches into autopilot mode, enabling you to carry on doing tasks quickly, accurately, and without conscious thought. Our autopilot, people of God, our autopilot mode seems to be run by a set of brain structures called the default mode network. When you think about the word default of a computer program or other mechanism to revert, right in the spirit, to revert automatically to a pre-selected option. You got to understand that in the spirit, our default mode network is our sin nature. It is our flesh. Amen. And when we are not constantly renewing our minds. Amen. Because again, it said we get into auto mind, autopilot when our minds just begin to wander. And that's why the Bible talks so much to us as believers about our minds and why they need to be transformed and why we need to change our thinking. Because if we don't stay on top of our minds, our minds will drift and we will find ourselves back in default mode, our sin nature. So when we are not constantly renewing our minds, which transforms us, we will go into default nature. 
We were born into a default mode of, of, of living according to our flesh and doing what our flesh wants us to do. That's why you could be walking with God for a while, but then when you're in automatic pilot mode, just wandering, you're able to, to do certain things, but at the end of the day, it's because the mode that we've slipped into. And when we slip into that mode, we find ourselves doing and saying and acting the way we used to. Because when, when we're focused... And when we're really thinking about how we're living, when we're really thinking about what we're saying, when we're really thinking about where we're going, guess what? We don't run on autopilot. We, we making sure this is this and this is that. But when we slack up, we find ourselves in certain positions, doing certain things. I, I, I know me. I, I, I know myself very well. I know when I get laxed. And, it's, and, and, and guess what? When I get laxed, it ain't even that. I, it ain't that I'm walking out the door getting ready to go sin. That's what the devil would love for me to do. But at the end of the day, I know you got to know yourself. Because sometimes when you get a little lax, what once bothered you don't even bother you no more. You got to know yourself. Because all of us have a default mode that we go back to when we don't constantly keep our minds renewed and the only the, the purpose of our minds being renewed because renewed minds change the way we think and when we change the way we think we change the way we live and what we do oh an, a, a, another another a point that my footnote says in in James it says uh, one of the other reasons why, 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 why we blame others or make excuses for evil thoughts or wrong actions is, is we say, I was pressured into it. I was pressured into it. That word pressure, to pressure means to attempt to persuade or coerce someone into doing something. Let me say this to you. If the people in your life are pressuring you to sin against God, against his word, and against his ways, you don't need those kind of people in your life. You don't need those kind of people in your life. You need people that's going to pressure you into living holy. You need people that's going to pressure you into pleasing God. You need people that's going to pressure you to be a better a, a version of yourself. We need people who will pressure us in the right way to do the right things. But oftentimes, we sometimes come in contact with people that pressure us. So when things happen, we say, I was pressured into it. Well, I'm here to tell you, change the company that you keep. Because the people that you hang around, the people that you deal with, guess what? They will have an effect on you. I don't care how good you think you are. I've been saved a long time. I've been free from drugs and alcohol for a long time. But let me tell you something. If I sounded like Fire Marshal Bill, let me tell you something. <laughs> All right, I had a moment, y'all. <laughs> anyway, if I hang around certain people doing certain things that I like, because you can't entice nobody with something that they don't like. See, even when we looked at our foundational scripture, we're drawn away enticed by, by our own desires. So we have some desires and habits and ways that we have picked up walking in our default mode here on this earth when we came into the earth realm. And so we got engaged in some stuff and some of us may have tried something and we ain't like it. Okay, we can't be tempted with it. But some of us tried something, we liked it, and so we did it and we continued to pursue it. But if I found myself constantly hanging around people who are doing the very things that I don't want to do, how many of y'all know I'm going to do it? I can't hang out in the crack house every day and think I ain't going to smoke no crack. Oh, I ain't smoked crack in years. But trust and believe. As long as I've been free from drugs. Crack wasn't the only thing, but as long as I've been free from drugs. If all of the people that I hang around with are doing those things, you know I'm going to go back to it. I told y'all, when God first started dealing with me in 1989, when I first got, got saved, 
When I first got saved, I, I didn't connect to a church. I didn't have anybody to really guide me as to what I would do. So I would try to read the Bible on my own. But there was, there was something on the inside of me that was like, I can't do the stuff I used to do. I can't go to the same places that I used to go to. And so I used to just stay to myself in the salon, right? Stayed to myself. People was in there. And, you know, my, my friend Renee, you know, she was one of the stylists in there. And, you know, she was like, oh, you, do you ever do anything? All you do is do hair and read your Bible. Won't you hang out with us? Hang out with us one night. Now, the thing is, y'all know clubbing was my thing. Partying was my thing. And so I was like, nah, I would say no. Then eventually one day I was like, okay, I'm going to go. So I went and guess what? First time I went to the club, it ain't like I did nothing. Now, I'm, I'm feeling like a fish out of water because I ain't twisted, okay? Because I never partied sober, okay? That just wasn't part of my M.O. And so now I'm in here, I'm looking at everybody, but I refuse to drink. I ain't, I ain't get high or nothing before I came. I wasn't doing that type of stuff, you know? And so, yeah, I may have tried to dance a little bit, but it, it, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. But I went. How many of y'all know I went again? Because they was like, come on, go again. So I went again. Sooner or later, you know what? I'm going to just get one drink. I'm going to just get me one little drink and I'm going to be all right. Because, you know, maybe I'll loosen up and really could party like I normally would party. Get that little drink. But guess what? I go again. So now I go again. I get the drink. Now I'm freaking on the dance floor, leaving that joint, laying over somebody. Next thing you know, I'm back to getting high again. It's a cycle. The reality of it is we have to be mindful. And so I'm telling you, who you are around, the company that you keep, it will have an effect on you. But don't take my word, people of God. Listen to what the word of God says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, the Passion Translation. It says, stop fooling yourselves. Stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and character. The bad part about it is that as the children of God, being the salt and the light, we are the ones that's supposed to help transform people from their bad character and their bad morals. But sometimes if we ain't strong enough, amen, they end up changing us. See, the thing is, since, since, since I've been saved, have I been in a crack house? Sure have. Me and my husband went on a mission to pull a woman that we know out the crack house. See, I wasn't there just to be there. I was there on a mission. You got to know when you can, when you, you got to have purpose in what you do. You got to have purpose. Again, when Jesus hung out with the sinners, he didn't just hang out with them just to be hanging out and chilling. He was trying to convert them. He was trying to save them from their sins because the word tells us that he was born to save his people from their sins. And so, so when you think about it, yes, we did what we had to do ministry-wise to pull somebody out of that environment. But at the end of the day, I will never get to the point where I'm cocky and think that I could just be in there just to be up in there. No, it's not a place for me to be. And too often, we don't realize that who we surround ourselves with has an effect on us. Again, it says, stop fooling yourselves. Evil companions will corrupt good morals and behavior. Another excuse that we use is, well, I ain't even know it was wrong. That might be true for some. You may not have known it was wrong, but guess what? Don't you know that not knowing something doesn't free you from the consequences? You could be driving on the street. You could be speeding. You don't see none of the signs that tell you how fast you was going, but the police pull you over. And they can pull you over and say, do you know how fast you was going? And you can say no. And you can say, do you know what the uh, speed limit is on this road? You can say no. Do you think your ignorance is going to get you out of your consequences just because you ain't know? The bottom line is, just because we don't know something doesn't mean that we won't deal with the consequences. But sometimes we'll say, well, I didn't know it was wrong. But let's be for real. Some of us be trying to play dumb. Let's, let, let's be for real. Some of us be trying to play dumb like we don't know something is not wrong. <laughs> I got to just use this example. Because there are some individuals that like to play dumb when certain things take place. I'm talking about men. 
I'm just being honest. Sometimes men will play. If, if a man, don't you start preaching, Pastor Mitchell. Don't you get that mic. But sometimes men will play. If a man get caught messing around, all of a sudden he going to play dumb like he ain't even know this was really wrong. For real, come on now. Let's just say this. If you are in a relationship and you give your number to another woman, when you get caught, because you done got caught messing with that woman, guess what? You can't say to your woman, well, I ain't know getting her number was wrong. No, that's playing dumb. You think somebody dumb and going to fall for that? You knew when you got it. Because guess what? When you got it, why you ain't tell your woman, say, hey, I want you to call my friend that I just met the other day. Hello. And so sometimes people, you, you got something to say, Pastor? Because you know I'm right about it, right? Huh? Huh? <laughs> he said, preach to the people. <laughs> so... Look, he was grabbing that mic for a minute. But that's just an example because sometimes we like to play like we dumb, like, like we didn't know something was wrong. And a lot of times we want to play dumb when we are exposed. When we get exposed, then we want to try and act like, well, I, I ain't know it was wrong. And then it says as well in the footnote for the ninth point, God is tempting me. Well, the word tempt means to entice or attempt to entice someone to do something that they know to be wrong or not beneficial. We already read in James chapter 1 that God doesn't tempt anybody, amen? And so we need to understand without a shadow of a doubt, we can never say this and think it holds weight that God tempt me. No, he didn't. God will never tempt us. Even when... The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It was Satan that tempted him. It was the Holy Spirit that led him to the wilderness. But it was Satan that tempted him. The word said, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. And how many of y'all know, as believers, we all have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was led into the spirit, led by the spirit into the wilderness. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. See, there are certain things that the Spirit may lead you to do or lead you to go here or lead you to go there. But let me tell you something. Once you go there or once you do that, that don't mean that the enemy ain't going to be present. That's why you got to always be watching. But it was the enemy that tempted him. Not God, not the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so this was actually a time of testing for Jesus Christ. Amen. And we have to understand that as children of God, we too will be tested as we face different trials. Trials are going to happen in life. They're going to come our way. And guess what? In the midst of it, God is saying, I done taught you and I done showed you what you should and should not do. Now what you going to do? See, now it's a matter. Am I going to pass the test? Because guess what? God done equipped me. God done schooled me. He done made it clear. I'm fully aware. I'm not ignorant about what he wants. So now that I'm faced with this this, this temptation, am I going to pass the test or not? And so we too will be tested as we face different trials. And oftentimes when we are being tested or in a trial, how many of y'all know that's when we're tempted to sin? See, 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 you could be in a trial broke as I don't know what. Bills need to get paid. And it is at that moment in that trial that you're going through. Now, the Bible say count it all joy. It's, it's hard when your pockets ain't, 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 ain't filled. But the Bible tells us to. And when we get to a point of maturity, we know how to have joy even when our pockets ain't filled. But in the midst of that moment of going through that trial and you are lacking in finances. Oh, the devil will try to bring some stuff to your mind to make ends meet. It is in those moments when we might be tempted to sin. I'm broke. I need that. I'm going to just go ahead and lift that. I I, I, I need this in my house. I don't have it. So I'm going to go boost it. See, at that moment, we're tempted to sin. Sometimes when we're in tough places, we're tempted to do wrong 
to make the matter right. But I'm here to tell you, sinning will never make things right. But a lot of times we, we do that. Like sinning will make a situation better. It won't. And so the, the, the conclusion of that footnote, it says a person who makes excuses is trying to shift the blame from himself or herself to something or someone else. A Christian, on the other hand, accepts responsibility for his or her wrongs. At least this is what we should do. Accept responsibility for his or her wrongs, confesses them, and asks God for forgiveness. When we do this, this should produce genuine repentance. A turning away from sin, disobedience, or rebellion, and a turning back to God. Once I, once I go deeper into talking about repentance, you will, you're going to understand that the Greek definition is, is focused on changing the way you think. See, because that's key with repentance. See, that was the problem with Jonah. Jonah's thinking never changed. His thinking never changed. He may have cried out in his affliction, but the issue that Jonah had before he was put into the belly of the fish, that issue was still there. His thinking was still jacked up. Now, in the midst of his affliction, he could cry out, Lord God, I realize that I'm wrong in what I've done. I know I should have obeyed you, Lord. I know this don't please you. I know it's a sin because I know what the Bible says. Now, can say all the right stuff in the moment. Get out the situation. And guess what? Think the same. And when you think the same, it means your heart is the same. And guess what? Your faulty actions will be the same no change will be evident because repentance has to do with your thinking and if you don't change your thinking you will not change you will not obey God you will not do what you need to do and so in this teaching, I'm going to be talking more about true repentance, what it looks like versus what we do. And so, in conclusion for today, we all have a sin nature. Everybody in this room has a sin nature. We don't have to be taught how to sin. That's what we have to understand. You don't have to teach people how to sin it's naturally in us it's our default mode and so we got to understand turn to genesis chapter 6 chapter uh, genesis chapter 6 new living translation genesis chapter 6 we're going to start at verse 5 I'm going to start at verse 5 in the New Living Translation. And as I said, we don't have to be taught how to sin. It's naturally in us. And our sinful ways, people of God, hear me on this. Whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, please don't think that God don't care about unbelievers who sin. Because when God gave his son Jesus because of love, it says God so loved the world. That was every human being he ever created and so what we have to understand God the one who created man in his image he is an individual that is affected by what we do and oftentimes and I've said this a lot of times we don't think about how our faulty ways and our actions and our ways of disobedience and, and rebellion we never think about how it affect God how many times before you sin do you say, well, God, how, how are you going to feel about this? A lot of times we just do what we want to do. Ain't that right? We do what we want to do. But, but, but we, we need to understand that our sinful ways has an effect on God. 
Genesis chapter 6, starting at verse 5. This is the New Living Translation. We're going to read verse 5 through 8, and it says, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth. And he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Hmm. Here's the, this, 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 sen- this sentence right here. <sighs> so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. Let me, t- let me tell you something. As a child of God, you should never want God to look at you and be sorry that he ever made you. Think about it. He's our father. We're his children. You don't ever want to be to the point where your mother and your father say, I wish I never had you. The only thing that will push a parent to that point is ongoing frustration because of the actions of the child. God was sorry that he even made man. You should get to a point in your own life where, where you, you, your mindset is, God, I don't ever want you to look at me and be sorry that you made me because of my choice to go against your will. And so it says, so the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. People of God, God has a heart. God feels when we walk in disobedience to him. It hurts him. And so it broke his heart. And the Lord said, it broke his heart. Let me me say this. Sin breaks his heart. Sin breaks his heart. Not, not, see, our mind is, this sin I do, I know God ain't tripping over that. God ain't tripping over that. Oh, Jesus. Whew. That's how we are sometimes. We think what we're doing, they sinning against God that we, willing, that we know. We think God ain't sweating our stuff, but he's he more so concerned about people to do this and that. You better stop listening to the devil that's lying to you. Because God don't like sin, period. I don't care what it is. Stop putting it in a particular category with your high-minded, prideful self. Stop making it seem like you are better off than people that do this or do that. Like it's a, like it's a little white lie. Liars lie. Ain't no little white lie. A lie is a lie. But in this world, we want to try to try to make things where it ain't as bad. Like it's a little white lie, so it ain't that bad. You know, I look at stuff. You know, we see we see stuff as kids growing up. But in, in the Wizard of Oz, you had the good witch and the bad bad witch. Witches are bad. Period. This is something that's going around right now. And I don't know if you know about it, but the, the, this whole, this whole uh, 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 good witch thing, in the, even in the kingdom of God, it's, it's some crap. A witch is a witch. A warlock is a warlock. Sin is sin. We got to stop trying to put it in different categories. And so it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe out I will wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Because that was his solution. I need to get rid of all of them. All of them. Let me tell y'all something. Don't fool yourself into thinking that God don't take people out. Because he tired of them. I've said it before. Sometimes the only thing that saves a person is death. 
Because some people want to constantly walk in disobedience and rebellion to God. And yes, they are his child. But his thing is, you are embarrassing me too much in the earth realm. You just don't want to get it right. Come on home. The Bible says in in Ecclesiastes, should we die before our time because of sin? Talks about premature death. Stop lying to yourself thinking that everybody died. It 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 was purpose. It was ordained. That's the way God wanted it. God is fully aware of everything that takes place here on this earth. But there are some things where it's like, you know what? Wipe them out. That's the only thing, again, sometimes to save people. But, but, but God got to the point, he wanted to destroy everything that he created and said, he said, I will wipe this human race I've created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing. All the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground and even the birds of the sky. He was like, I'm starting with a clean slate. He said, I, 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 I am sorry I ever made them. Come on now. Pastor Mitchell said, they ain't even had nothing. What, what did the birds do wrong? What, what, what did the large animals do? What did the, what did the little animals do? Sometimes, sometimes you just feel like you got to start with a clean slate. Because guess what? Sin is like cancer. It can spread. That's why even in houses of God, we got to be individuals that deal with stuff within the camp. Because guess what? That mess will spread. So in his mind, just get rid of it all. But he had grace on one, and that was Noah. Noah and his family. He had grace on Noah and his family. And so he destroyed everybody but them. And so again, people of God, We do not have to be taught how to sin because sin has been inside of us since childhood. Look at Genesis chapter 8, 21, last scripture that you're going to turn to, New Living Translation, because I want you to see it in the word. And so we got to understand that God did destroy everything before by flood, but he also made a vow that I I ain't even going to do that no more. His thing is, I'm not going to do that anymore because guess what? I know what's in you. He knows what's on the in, inside of us. So his thing is, I'm not going to do that no more. And so look at Genesis chapter 8, because guess what? Sin has been inside of us since childhood. Genesis chapter 8, verse 21, New Living Translation. The Lord said, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. That's why it's so easy for your precious little three-year-old or four-year-old to lie to you. (laughs) It's a trip. It's it's just, you know, lie to you, try to hide, because even when they doing stuff that's wrong, a lot of times they know up front, but they want to play it off like we try to do when we get caught. I think about my grandson the other day. He know I'm not one of the ones to play all that jumping on the bed. So, you know, he was over there in the room having a good time. I looked and he just on top of the bed, just doing whatever. And so, so then when I showed my face, he was like, mm-hmm, you know. And look, looking, all, looking at me all nervous, right? Because he knew I caught him. He knew he wasn't supposed to do that. But guess what? He knew he wasn't supposed to do it before he did it. But it's just something on the inside of us that just want to do what we ain't supposed to do. And God know that. He said, guess what? I'm not going to destroy everything again. Because guess what? Everything they think or imagine has been towards evil from childhood. And so although God knows that our hearts are evil, he still continues to try to reach them. Because he loves us and because he only wants better for us. So. If we are bent towards evil from childhood, what do we need to do? Well, the first step is to be born again. But you need to know that's just the beginning, not the end. We were born into sin. We need to be born again. And So I'm going to continue this teaching next week. As we continue to look at sin, as we continue to look at the effects of sin in our lives and what we can do about it 
so that we won't be controlled by it. And so I said that the first step, which is the most important step, is salvation being born again. And I don't want to end this moment of teaching and preaching without giving someone the opportunity to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when it comes down to receiving Christ, it simply means acknowledging your belief in Jesus Christ, inviting him to come into your life, turning to God from your present way of living, repentance, and then beginning the adventure of letting God direct your life. And the moment you ask God to come into your life, it's done. It's a done deal. And so I'm saying to anyone in here today, I don't know about you, young man, have you ever received Christ as your Lord and Savior? I just want to extend the opportunity. You've heard the word today. There may be somebody that's tuning in on Facebook Live. Because one thing about it, you don't have to be in a church to receive Jesus Christ. It's a decision that you can make wherever you want. I made my decision in the detox center getting clean from drugs. But again, let me make it clear again. Receiving Christ, I want to make it plain. Receiving Christ, it don't mean you're going to live holy. It don't mean that you ain't going to make no mistake. No, you done already heard that. Guess what? <laughs> Once we get saved, everything don't change just like that. We got to grow. We got to learn about God's word. We got to get in fellowship with other believers and things of that nature. But I want you to be clear online. I want you to be clear, sir. It's a choice. It's, it's not something that I'm forcing anyone to do. Nobody can force you to accept Christ. But sometimes people don't accept Christ because they don't really understand what it is. But I want to make it simple to those of you all that are tuning in, those of you all in, again, in the room. Again, receiving Christ, salvation, simply means acknowledging your belief in Christ. One thing about it, a lot of people acknowledge Jesus Christ, but they haven't taken the next step in asking him to come into their life. A lot of people uh, uh, believe in God, but they haven't taken the next step to get to a point where they invite him to come into their life. A, a, a lot of people know God. The question is, does he know you? Just like I said to you, I feel like I already know you. I know of you. But the truth is, I don't know you. I've seen pictures of you. But the truth is, I don't know you. Know nothing about you. It's just like with God and Jesus. People know of God. They've heard of God from what other people say. But for real, they don't really know him. But there's a scripture that says there comes a point in time in our life where, where, where this life ends and we're knocking on the door because all of us going to have to meet the Lord face to face. I think about one of the songs that we sung today mentioned, one of the songs that was played. It said, talked about how every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. You got to understand, on the day, when your day comes, I don't care who you are, you're going to have that moment where you come face to face with God, everybody. And it's going to be some people to be like, oh, my God, Jesus is Lord. But at that moment, it's going to be too, too late. It's too late to come to that realization when you're in his presence. It's something that you have to acknowledge and accept while you're here on this earth. But every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. And so it's a scripture that talks about people knocking on the door, trying to get in. And Jesus saying, who are you? I don't know you. Depart from me. You work of iniquity. And then they started with, God, come on, Jesus. You know me. You know I've seen you. I've been in places in the church, uh, 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 in, in, in here, wherever. You know I've seen you. I've been places I heard. Yeah. Um, but I don't know you. See, because no one is about a relationship. I don't know you yet. <laughs> but, but when you get in a relationship with a person, you begin to know them and learn things about them. And even though God is the creator of all, he, he wants that intimate relationship because knowing someone is intimate. And that's what God wants. 
And so, again, receiving Christ means acknowledging your belief in Christ, inviting him to come into your life, turning to God from your present way of living. And, and guess what? When you accept Christ and ask him to come into your life, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. He's your God. He helps you. You need people in your life that can help you. You're not, your life ain't going to turn around just like that. I don't want anybody to think that just because you receive him, your life turn around just like that. No, your eternal destination does. If you die today or tomorrow after receiving him, you ain't going to hell. Your destination changes just like that. But your character, your ways, your morals, all of that take time. How many of y'all know we all are a work in progress? Hello? And so inviting him to come into your life, turning to God from your present way of living, and then beginning the adventure. Because it is a wonderful adventure. But beginning the adventure of letting God direct your life. And when you come to that place and you realize that you want to receive him, it's a game changer. And so those of you tuning in, you may realize on today that you want to receive Christ. I'm extending it to you. If it's something that you want to do, just say yes or no. You can say, I'm ready or I'm not so sure yet. One thing about it, about God, a lot of times is when we come to this moment, we've been doing a lot of thinking about God. <laughs> we've been having a lot of conversations about God. The Holy Spirit been tugging on our hearts. We just ain't said yes yet. You want to say yes? You sure? Come on down here, sir. Come on here to me. Raquel, come stand with your brother. Amen. Hallelujah. We rejoice right now. We rejoice right now because God is changing everything right now about who you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. This is the best decision that you could ever make in your entire life. Hold your brother's hand and turn towards me. And I want, you to, I want you to simply repeat this after me. Those of you all that are tuning in online and you're making this decision from the comfort of your house, I want you to make this decision today. It's a simple prayer, but I want you to just simply say, Dear God, I know that my sin has separated me from you. Thank you for giving your son Jesus Christ. To die in my place for my sins. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me for my sins and to come into my life. Please, Lord, begin to direct my life. On this day, I thank you for saving a sinner like me, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome to the family of God. <laughs> Woo! I gotta hug again. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, I'm hugging. I ain't even got my mask on. I'm just excited, amen, but he got his on, amen. But come on, come on, we just give God some praise, amen. Because this is the moment where the angels rejoice because, because a decision has been made. Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Life ain't going to be easy. I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you that you're going to feel something. This ain't about a feeling right here. Hallelujah. This is about a knowing. And I don't care what you may do from this day forward. Don't let the devil try and trick you and make you think in any way, shape, form, or fashion that you're not saved. You are saved. You ask the Lord to come into your life. You have a under you've you've had some concerns about God. You know things about God, but today is your yes day. Hallelujah. Don't ever doubt this day. September the 5th, 2021. Amen. Welcome Hallelujah. to the Hallelujah. kingdom of God. Can y'all give God some praise? Hallelujah. You may be seated, sir. Come on, y'all. Amen. Can y'all rejoice for somebody else's salvation? Lord, have mercy. 